This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being. Being well. Some of the topics are addiction, fear, faith, self-compassion, relationships, codependency, emotional intelligence, and more. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Valeria Telles, and today I'm having a conversation with Josh Sandeman about addiction. Josh Sandeman is a family nurse practitioner. He graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a degree in American Civilization and Psychology. Josh has worked as a programmer, analyst, and research assistant in Penn's Addiction Treatment Research Center for five years before enrolling in a doctoral program in theoretical neuroscience. For 10 years, he worked in Silicon Valley as a software engineer before switching to medicine, a childhood interest. In this episode, Josh and I will discuss some of the experiences, research, and ideas of Dr. Gabor Mate, the author of the book, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. In the book, Gabor Mate writes that he sees addiction as one of the most misunderstood phenomena in our society. People who should know better such as doctors and policymakers, believe addiction to be a matter of individual choice or, at best, a medical disease. It is both simpler and more complex than that. Addiction, or the capacity to become addicted, is very close to the core of the human experience. That is why almost anything can become addictive from healthy activities such as eating or exercising to abusing drugs intended for healing. The issue is not an external target, but our internal relationship to it. Addictions, for the most part, develop in a compulsive attempt to ease one's pain or distress in the world. Given the amount of pain and dissatisfaction that human life engenders, many of us are driven to find comfort in external things. The more we suffer and the earlier in life we suffer, the more we are prone to become addicted. The inner city drug addicts are among the most abused and rejected people among us. But instead of compassion, our society treats them with contempt. Instead of understanding and acceptance, we give them punishment and moral disapproval. In doing so, we fail to recognize our own deeply rooted problems and the opportunity for healing not only for them, the extreme addicts, but also for ourselves as individuals and as a culture. Gabor writes. Here is the interview with Josh Sandeman. Welcome, Josh, and thank you for having a conversation with me today about addiction. In your own words, 
Who is Josh Sandman? I guess I would have to say I'm somebody who has has always had a diversity of interests. You know, I'm very curious about the world and how it works. You know, I have a strong humanistic side to me where I'm just very interested in people and what makes them work and, you know, how people thrive and live their best lives. I really enjoy being physically active. You know, I feel like, you know, having a physically fit, active body is really important to well-being and wellness and helps keep me thinking more clearly and more sane. And <laughs> so, um, and I think, you know, being comfortable with having a lot of different interests has, I think, been very freeing for me. I, you know, I think I succumb to for a long time when I was younger, the idea that you have to be sort of focused on one thing. And uh, I think part of maturing over the course of my life has been recognizing that, you know, it's okay to be interested in a lot of things and passionate about a lot of things. That's great. Thank you. What is your experience with addiction? Um, well, I have personal experience because I had both of my grandfathers were alcoholics and, uh, you know, and that had an impact on my parents and ultimately on me too. I also, you know, after I graduated from college, I uh, took a job in my alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania, in their addiction treatment research center, which is a ver was a very large scale um, center for studying all sorts of addiction, you know, including gambling, tobacco, cocaine, alcohol, you know, heroin, the whole thing. And I spent five years there kind of helping with the research, analyzing data, working with the patients. And so I had a lot of direct experience with sort of the lower socioeconomic strata in a large East Coast city, Philadelphia. Um, and that was sort of at the height of the uh, crack cocaine epidemic. It was a fascinating and challenging situation, you know, from which I learned, I think I learned a lot both academically and just from experiencing these people's lives and what they were going through and sort of the larger context of what they were going through in terms of, you know, social justice and socioeconomics and racism and, you know, the whole, the whole ball of wax. And then for, you know, I, I pursued some other things for many years. And then when I decided to get back and pursue medicine, I work primarily with a Medicaid population, again, lower socioeconomic strata, and, you know, substance abuse is probably a little bit more common than the national average in that group. And so it often factors into some of the many other things that are going on in these people's lives, including other mental health problems and just the general effects of poverty and chronic disease like diabetes and high blood pressure and all that. So it's What's interesting about what I'm doing now is that it's as a general practitioner or a primary care practitioner, you know, you work with the whole picture of this person's life. And, um, you know, and oftentimes substance abuse is a big part of that because it's what their parents did and their grandparents did. But it also it is an almost uh, universal human tendency to try and relieve suffering and give themselves a break from stress and their worries and their concerns. I'm always curious to understand the definition of addiction according to different people. Um, yes. And Gabor Mate, in his book, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, he says that addiction is a sign or a signal, a uh, symptom of distress. And then mm -hmm. he asks, is it a language that tells us about a difficult situation that must be understood. So what is your definition of addiction? You know, kind of like I alluded to earlier before we started the interview, I think it's, I'm cautious about defining it. You know, I think first of all, people are actually trying to get away from the use of the word addiction in the field, just because of a lot of its baggage in terms of stigmatism and whatnot. And they're kind of going more for terms like substance use disorder. I don't even like that because I don't feel like it's always a substance. I think, you know, as I was alluding to earlier, I think these systems um, involve basic human capacities to assess what we need and what we want and then make a plan and focus on getting what we need or want, you know, and that's very functional. It's necessary for survival. 
But like almost anything else, any other capacity we have, it can become extreme or pathological in some way. And I think what we really mean by addiction or a use disorder is where it almost becomes kind of an obsessive compulsive thing where you become so focused and obsessed with using a substance or a career or whatever it is that it's to the exclusion of everything else. Family gets neglected, basic needs get neglected, other responsibilities get neglected. It just becomes sort of so single, you become so single-minded about something and you just crave it and you, you have to get the next fix or the next whatever or keep working. Um, and it has a negative impact on the rest of your life and your life as a whole. Um, and, you know, you can't, I don't think you can put a hard line, you know, an objective line where it has become pathological. But as clinicians, we try to just get a general sense of has this person really lost control and become overly obsessed with something? Um, and is it having a, a significant negative impact on the rest of their lives? And so it's not like a hard and fast definition, but you're kind of looking at the total context of somebody's life to see how much it's becoming unraveled by you know what they're doing. We talked earlier about basic needs that we all have, and we lose track of what they are, or maybe we don't know what, what they mm -hmm. are. And that's why mm -hmm. we become addicted to not just substance, but everything else could be people, love, uh, work. Gabor, in his book, he says that few of us escape the lure of addictive behaviors. I think that no one is completely pain-free or sober enough or fearless enough not to be addicted to anything. What would you say to that? Right. So... <laughs> I think it's tricky because we're all very like passionate about something or feel like we need to have something on a regular basis in our lives. You know, some of us would get very, very crabby if we went several days without reading our favorite book, or we would feel very upset if we couldn't run or go for a walk for a few days because of bad weather or an injury or whatever. Um, some of us are just super passionate about bird watching and you know we would really be upset if we couldn't watch birds so i think for me it keeps getting back to being passionate and really wanting something doesn't have to be unhealthy and when we start to use terms like addiction and substance misuse and whatnot implicit in that is sort of a judgment that it's unhealthy I think people can be very passionate and obsessed with something and it can still be relatively constructive and healthy. It doesn't have to be unhealthy. You know, it becomes unhealthy when I think, again, like I said before, if, if people are neglecting other parts of their life, you know, if they just feel like they've lost control over, you know, what it is they're going after, whether it's losing weight or whatnot, or if it is to kind of you know, if, if there's something going on that's feeding that desire, like lack or pain or, you know, loneliness or whatever, obviously people can pick things that are healthier to be obsessed with, you know, a hobby as opposed to drugs. But if they're not addressing that underlying pain, um, then they're not actually being as constructive as they could be. You know, they might need to do therapy or some other spiritual work to address that sense of lack or emptiness that's making them obsessed with whatever it is they're obsessed with. Yeah. So we are using words here to define the pursuit, the intense pursuit of things or whatever it is. Yeah. So what is the difference between an obsession and an addiction? It's hard to define, like I said before, you know, like kind of alluded to before, it's hard to define really quantitatively or formally. I think it is sort of a fuzzy judgment call that has to do with like the total effect on somebody's life. Like if, if somebody is so obsessed with their career that they spend no time with their kids, no time with their spouse, they're hardly ever home. 
Um, they're not sleeping well. They eat poorly because they don't really want to be out of the office. So they're constantly ordering pizza and takeout. You know, if if their life is basically just a very poor overall quality and they're neglecting a lot of things that they really should be addressing, you know, I would say that that's certainly crossed the line into pathological behavior. You know, they're just too obsessed with their career. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, but it's a continuum. You know, it's not categorical. It's dimensional. And so, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot, there's a continuum there from, you know, somebody who has a very lighthearted approach to something like their running or their hobby or whatever to somebody who is clearly so obsessed that they probably need some help. And so, and again, I don't think there's a strict boundary there where you've definitely crossed into the pathological behavior. But again, as clinicians, we kind of make a judgment call about when things seem to have crossed the line to the point where the person needs help or needs to address it. Yes. I was thinking about um, what you said. So if, if we just, we are using words here, um, obsession, addiction, the cause for addiction, it's... Um, emotional pain. So they're just so afraid of addressing their pain uh, that they will look for something else to relieve that pain. The problem is when it becomes unhealthy. It's when we yep. are just neglecting other important areas in our lives. Personally, I feel that compensation only goes so far with virtually everyone. And I think sooner or later, you're going to pay an increasingly high price for not addressing fundamental issues with you spiritually or psychologically that you're not really addressing by being obsessed with something. So, so, in, and in my experience too, you know, just working with patients, you know, it, it all catches up with them eventually. You know, you can only deny and defer and run away from things for so long before they do catch up with you. And of course, with substance use, that itself becomes part of the problem. And that's part of the reason why people's lives eventually crash and burn, because it's not just that they're running from pain, from childhood abuse or domestic violence or, you know, the loss of a child or whatever, whatever tragedy has befallen them that is really driving that emotional pain. You know, they add on top of that something that is really harmful to their mind and their body, like methamphetamine use, and that just adds to the problem and their lives become unma more unmanageable, not just because of the unaddressed pain, but because they've added this other thing that's extremely harmful in its own right. And, you know, eventually, you know, I think people do crash and burn. And of course, that can happen more than once. People can go through a crisis and then recover a little bit and then go right back to what they were doing before. And that can repeat many times. And not everyone ever gets out of that cycle, unfortunately. But I think part of the reason why is that they're really not coming to terms with what's really going on with them. And so the compensation isn't working. <laughs> yes, yeah. So... And, and usually it doesn't. In my case, one of the ways that I released a lot of that energy was to dance. I used to dance. Yeah, I think that's, that's why art therapy has been very successful because that's an example of sort of a, a healthy strategy. And it usually has to, yeah, like, like with the dance, it has, it's a way of expressing and working with your emotions in a way that is healing. You know, it's not necessarily like psychotherapy, but painting, drawing, writing. Uh, you know, the the recently deceased author Mary Oliver. Um, that was a driving force in her writing was the traumas she experienced younger in life, and writing for her was intensely therapeutic. And you know, clearly, that's a very different sort of passion and way of working through your emotions than simply out and out running from them you know, deny, denying them or trying to numb them out. You know, I think, um, you know, that's a key distinction there is that you with your dance and Mary Oliver with her writing were actually working with the emotions in a way that was meaningful and constructive. Yes, writing is another tool. Yeah, wonderful yes. tool. Another thing that I believe with all my heart is true connections. I think that that's another psychological or spiritual need uh, in all of us. Yeah. Do you believe that 
human connection, true human connection can be a healing tool for addiction? Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And like you alluded to in some of our previous conversation, I think, um, yes, I think healthy connection um, to other people is is critical to our well-being. I mean, we're intensely social creatures and we're meant to emotionally support each other. And when that's lacking or, or you know, when either it's lacking or it's actually destructive, like for children who go through abuse and whatnot, um, I think it's it's equally destructive as healthy relationships are constructive. And, you know, and I think that's a lot of what spirituality is about, too, is it's not just connection to other people. It's connection to the world, to the universe, to God, you know, something higher than yourself. And, you know, I think that it's just a deeper expression of that intense need to feel connected, that you matter and that you're part of something greater than yourself. Yeah, and spirituality, it sounds so, a lot of times, very abstract, the idea of yes. being spiritual. What is your definition of spirituality? I think people have different ways of expressing that, you know, and I think a lot of it has to do with connection, being part of something bigger than themselves. For me, I have been practicing Zen Buddhism for about 22 years now. And for me, I really resonate with Zen because spirituality has a lot to do with cultivating your capacity to just really attend to life moment by moment. And that that, in some sense, is one of the greatest forms of love for the world is just to really show up for it, you know, whether it's painful or whether it's pleasant or whatever is happening, you know, there's a kind of deep reverence for the world as it is, just to be open to what it is, even if part of your emotional response to it is that I don't like what's happening right now. That's included. Everything is included. And, you know, I, so I don't have a lot of mystical inclinations. Um, you know, I'm sort of, you know, I have no particular emotional or intellectual opinion about God or, you know, the ultimate nature of truth. But for me, Zen is just very practical. It's very here and now. It's about taking care of your life and the lives of people around you by paying attention, by being aware and being open to learning and understanding. And, you know, that was sort of the core message of what I understand the Buddha to have been teaching 25 centuries ago. And, you know, I've, I've stuck with it for 22 years because it just really deeply resonates with me. And that's that's my spirituality. Yeah, I like that. I love the idea, the concept of staying in between, like you don't take sides or you try to. It's really hard not like yeah. or dislike something. Um, that <laughs> yeah. is the hardest thing to do, but I think it's the, 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 the most peaceful place to be, a way to live. Yeah. So going back to the, to the content of the book, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, uh, yep. Mate said, if drug addicts seem to have chosen a path to nowhere, they still have much to teach the rest of us. In the dark mirror of their lives, we can trace outlines of our own. Mate asks some interesting questions that I'm going to ask mm -hmm. you, Josh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, what are the main causes of addiction? No one knows for sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's still an active area of research, but I think, like with anything, it's a combination of factors. There definitely seems to be some kind of genetic predisposition in terms of neurochemically how you respond to certain substances. A huge amount of it does seem to be life experience, especially in the formative years. And it doesn't have to be the dramatic, you know, child abuse kind of thing. It can be, you know, affluent families where nothing like that is overtly going on can still have dysfunction that, you know, leaves children feeling wanting or unloved or empty or whatnot that I think can predispose them to addiction. I think certainly, as you alluded to earlier, and as, you know, as Gabor Mate was pointing out, living in a culture that's built on desire doesn't help. Right, <laughs> certainly not. Where you're, yeah, you're always taught that you're lacking, you're, you're, you're missing something, you're missing out, you need this, you need that. 
you know, so I think it, it all goes into the soup. And I think, you know, it's it's like with a lot of different things about what makes us who we are. It's it's genes and experience. You said something interesting now about desire, wanting that we feel like something's lacking all the time. Most yes. of us feel like, you know, there's a need for more wisdom, let's say, yep. or less ignorance in the world. So how do we deal with this kind of desire? Yeah, well, I think, you know, there's there's healthy desires and not so healthy desires, right? And I think desire for wholeness and meaning and growth are seem like relatively healthy desires for me. I mean, obviously, it can become extreme and destructive and obsessive, you know, even if the overall goal is wholesome. But yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know that desire itself is is a problem. I think it depends on the context, you know, what it is you're desiring and what your relationship to your desire is. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes we need passion, right? The intensity to yes. pursue these desires, because if we don't, we just have them. Oh, I wish the right. world was better. I wish this, I wish that, but we never do anything about it. Right. Or sometimes yeah. we embrace these inner desires with so much um, passion that we come across obsessed. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> that's sort of the essence of life, right, is, is trying to find balance and it's dynamic and it's an ongoing process. And overall, I would have to say I'm a huge fan of passion. I think passion can be one of the most beautiful things about who we are. You know, I mean, think of all the things that people have done because they were passionate, you know, in terms of helping other people or inventing new drug treatments or showing us what's possible physically. I mean, it's just, you know, the list goes on and on and on. I mean, you know, passion is sort of, I think, essential to the human experience. It's like, yeah, I mean, we don't, we don't want to be like zombies or deadbeats or indifferent, you know, I mean, that would be, that would be awful. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, no, no, but, no. yeah, but it's like, it's a double-edged sword, you know, it's a blessing and a curse because our, our passion can blind us, our passion can become pathological and destructive, and, you know, we can become zealots and ideologues, and there's there's definitely a huge dark side to it. But, you know, that that seems to be the, the mystery of life is, is that you can't get the dark side without the light side, too. I mean, it's just, it's like a package deal. <laughs> Yes, right, Jess. We've got to accept reality for what is instead of yeah. trying to push away, you know, oh, I'm, I'm addicted to helping other people now, so that's not good. And the next question is, what is the nature of the addiction prone personality? Addictive personality, I think, is 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 a, is a concept that's been falling out of favor, you know, and I, I think that's probably a good thing. And I kind of agree with that. I'm not sure that there is an addiction-prone personality because when you hear people's stories and you look at the evidence, I mean, all sorts of people who nobody ever would have expected to start to develop a problem, you know, suddenly did. You know, there are certain characteristics like people who tend to be impulsive or, you know, not not as mindful about consequences or more, you know, risk takers or thrill seekers. You know, there are certain things like that that seem to increase the likelihood that you can develop addictive problems. But then again, you know, something that doesn't really have much to do with personality per se is just, you know, formative experiences, like just having been abused. And people have all different kinds of personalities who've been physically, sexually, and emotionally abused. But they, that is a predictor of substance abuse as well as depression and anxiety and, and other physical health problems too. So yeah, I, I like to not think too much about addiction prone personality and more just like what are the various risk factors that this particular person might have that put them at risk for problems or might explain why they develop them. Yeah, I agree. What happens physiologically in the brains of addicted people? It has a lot to do. There's, you know, there's a circuit in the limbic system of the brain, um, which has a lot to do with basic drives, you know, fear, desire, motivation, and then the frontal cortex, which, you know, the front part of the brain, which has a lot to do with um, making higher level decisions and, just, you know, basically deciding whether or not to listen to the limbic system <laughs> or to like inhibit that and. The limbic system may may scream, eat that entire chocolate cake, and the frontal lobe is like, yeah, that's not really a good idea. You know, just 
speaking loosely here. Um, so, but what happens with addiction is the part of the brain that responds to rewarding stimuli develops a stronger and stronger response to whatever it is, whether it's methamphetamine or heroin or gambling or whatever. And it drives the frontal cortex, you know, it basically tries to convince the frontal cortex that this really is urgent. And eventually what what seems to happen is that the frontal cortex starts to give up. You know, it's, it's not as powerful as the limbic system and, you know, it breaks down sooner and eventually it seems, you know, what they call frontal lobe release or whatever, it, it eventually, you know, basically just quiets down and the limbic system basically wins. And so people become very, very drive based and they're just, you know, only responding to those drives and they, they don't really have the regulation that most of us do with regards to whatever it is, you know, that they're obsessed with. That leads me to a very interesting question about self-control, yeah. willpower. How yeah. much choice do you think addicts really have? Yeah, well, <laughs> I think backing way up, I think a lot of neuroscientists would say that none of us really have any true choice, that free will is, is a little bit of an illusion when you get down to all of the various things that influence what people decide to say and do. Um, leaving aside that controversial question for a minute, I think I would say, practically speaking, people suffering from addiction do not have the same level of choice as people who don't have addiction simply because the systems in our brain which make decisions are the very systems that are, are not functioning properly. So they, they're they really in a different state from you and me and people who are not suffering from addiction. So I think, you know, treating them as people who are just being irresponsible or having poor judgment is not constructive. <laughs> Yeah, this is such an interesting subject. How much choice do we really have in life? The next question is about the war on drugs. Why is the war on drugs a failure? And what might be a humane evidence-based approach to the treatment of severe drug addiction? I think the war on drugs is a failure because it's, it's, it's the completely wrong approach. I mean, it's complicated, but there's a couple basic reasons for that. One is... People suffering from addiction are not criminals. Um, they're not people with character flaws. They're people who have a, you know, a serious dysfunction of, of how their brains work. Um, and treating them as criminals or people who need to be thrown in jail or further traumatized, as Gabor Mate argues so eloquently, is exactly the wrong approach. They need a little bit more love and support than the average person. They don't need to be brutalized by, you know, a, a, a barbaric criminal justice system. Um, so if you want to keep people addicted and miserable, design a system like the one we have. If you want people to recover, you need a totally different kind of system that treats people with compassion and dignity and addresses their needs, like we've been talking about with, for connection and meaning and and whatnot. The other problem is, as we as we learned from prohibiting alcohol in the early part of the 20th century, if you turn the drug business into a criminal business that's not regulated, that's what exactly what you get. You get a criminal empire. You you, you know, if it, if it's illegal to sell these things, you just get this completely unenforceable global criminal enterprise, which has caused you know just massive suffering. Um, all over the world, and it never ends because you know there, there's just a constant arms race between the police and the military and these drug cartels. Whereas if you just acknowledge these substances are not going away and turn it into legitimate businesses, you know, like when we got rid of alcohol prohibition, then you get like a you know an industry that's overseeable. Even though it seems paradoxical, I think, you know, ultimately it leads to a much better overall system if it's just regulated as opposed to just like a, basically a war. It's destroyed Mexico, which ironically, Mexico uh, did not want to launch a war on drugs and America pressured them into it back in the 1920s. And, you know, and here we are. Yeah. So that leads me to my, the next question. What do you think of medically supervised injection centers? 
Well, uh, yeah, I'm I'm a big believer in harm reduction, and uh, I think that's an excellent way to do harm reduction. You know, I think giving people a safe place to go with clean supplies and medical supervision can be a huge step in the right direction. You know, because ultimately people have to be ready to get their lives in order. And the more the more disorganized and desperate they are living on the streets, the less likely I think that's going to happen. You know, so starting to put them in environments where they're safe and they're cared for and whatnot, I think, you know, I think is and, and other countries have experimented with this, you know, not just decriminalization of drug use, but, you know, harm reduction measures. And they have had very good results like Switzerland and Portugal um, and even Canada to some degree, which Gabor Mate addresses. So we, we already have some actual evidence that this is a better way to go. Yeah. We go back to our conversation about acceptance. So in a way, like the system, it's not accepting people the way they are. Maybe they can't yes. change at this point. So you can't put right. all of them in prison. That won't help. Right. The next question, the last one and the set of questions from Garbor Mate is, what are some of the paths for redeeming addicted minds not dependent on powerful substance? That is, how do we approach the healing of the many behavior addictions fostered by our culture? Well, yeah, I mean, you kind of need a different culture, right? <laughs> yes, right. Um, <laughs> true. Oh, boy. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that has to happen organically. You know, I don't think you can do it top down. I don't, you know, I don't think governments can pass laws and policies, you know, um, that are going to help all that much. I think, I think it has to be the kind of the marketplace of ideas. I mean, you know, p people have to recognize that something's wrong with the way they live and there have to be options for them to make different choices. Whether or not we're ever going to get past, you know, this kind of materialist consumer culture where, you know, it's all about status and stuff, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't know how that could happen, but I think that it could. And maybe even some of the problems that we're having in terms of what's happening to our environment and our climate might generally push us in that direction. We're, you know, we're, you know, just like somebody suffering from addiction, you, you can get to the point where you, it's just inescapable that the, the path you're on is the wrong path. Yes. <laughs> you, know? you know, there's something to the whole hitting rock bottom thing. And, you know, I, I hate to think about what that means for our entire society, but maybe that's going to be part of the growing process for human beings is that we, we do perhaps need a more spiritually based life and a less materialistic one. I agree, because that causes this lack of awareness in a culture where you promote um, unhealthy eating, like the fast food yep. industry. How yep. can you ban or try to judge addicts? Because basically that's what you are creating in the first place. What are some proven methods you know personally that can lead us to renewal and transformation? Well, for me personally, I think... I just feel fortunate that I'm somebody who even knew that that was important in the first place, you know, and I kind of credit my parents with kind of teaching all of us that is that, you know, li life is fundamentally a, a process of growth and learning from your mistakes. Um, and it's not about, it's not fundamentally about your resume or where you went to college. And I think I'm just very grateful that that was a core value of mine because I think that's critical. You know, I mean, if, if you don't even think, you know, your character and your spiritual life is important, you know, how are you ever going to, you know, take that up? Yeah. <laughs> so I think it kind of starts there as somewhere along the line, there has to be some, some revelation that the depth of human life matters and not just the superficial stuff. And then for me personally, it's been kind of a combination of traditional Western psychotherapy and Zen practice, both of which gave me structure and training and wisdom for how, you know, it, basically a plan for how to make that happen. You know, and I think you mentioned something about that earlier. You can, you know, you, you have to have the desire and then you have to have a plan 
a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> and you also have to be ready. In your case, you're prepared yes. by your parents. So the terrain was yes. fertile. Yes. You know, and, and the thing is, we're all in different places. And like you said, even with people with addiction, you know, not everybody's ready. You know, we're, we're all in different places. We're all on different paths. And that's just that's just the way of the world. And, you know, you, you got to just tend your own garden. And um, there's only so much you can do about the rest of the planet. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, being aware of that, too, like being kind with ourselves, understanding that we are not ready for such change like transformation that's yeah. that's preached a lot you know in the industry of self-help everyone can yeah. transform everyone can do it and that's not true not everyone right. can do everything yeah. right um i have two questions for you um, that i believe are connected one is uh, do you consider addiction a disease is one uh, the second one is what is the connection between mental illness and addiction I don't like the disease model of addiction. You know, I, th I think, again, we don't even totally know what it is. And, you know, and so it's a little, you know, I, I think the disease medical model of addiction is, is, is not that helpful. So I think it, you know, it has more to do with psychosocial factors and, you know, a lot of different things like that. And I think the disease model is not that helpful. So if yeah. we don't refer to addiction as a disease, what would be the alternative? We don't really refer to depression as a disease or anxiety as a disease. We, we just kind of, you know, it's, it's a mental health disorder or it's some sort of maladaption in the brain as opposed to like, you know, pneumonia or diabetes <laughs> where, you know, it's some, something more physiological in our bodies that's the problem. It's controversial because people say at the end of the day, is this just really semantics? You know, whether you call it a disease or a disorder or whatnot, how much does it even really matter? And are we, is this just distracting us from just figuring out what to do about it? You know, I, I don't totally like to get into that whole debate because it's kind of a rabbit hole. But my general approach to mental illness of any kind, including addiction, is that this is just a person who's struggling and is not making the best decisions or living their best life for various reasons. And what are those reasons for this person and what's the best path forward? And yeah, I mean, and to, to your other question, you know, mental illness, you know, addiction, I think is a form of mental dysfunction, but people who struggle from schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and depression and anxiety, those are all risk factors for developing addiction. And, you know, th there's a lot of comorbidity there. I mean, a lot of people who have addiction have underlying mental health issues that are not being well addressed. Um, and so when we evaluate people, we evaluate all of that. You know, is there underlying depression? Is there underlying something else going on? PTSD, po post-traumatic stress disorder. And obviously that needs to be part of the treatment plan for them is to have those things addressed so that you know, the the addiction is easier to address. Yeah, thank you, Josh. Yeah, I know yeah. you say you don't like discussing the subject and I brought it up. Uh, so I appreciate you. Um, no, that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> giving you, your, your opinion about it. It is not easy to always accept and unconditionally love people who value their health and well-being less than the immediate drug driven needs of the moment. Mm -hmm. So my question to you um, based on this is, why do you think those who have dedicated their lives to help addicts at some point become frustrated, disapproving and judgmental of them and even rejecting them and wanting them to be different than what they are? I mean, I think in general, it, get, it sort of gets back to our passions and desires is, you know, is we're, we're creatures who like to reshape the world to be more in line with how we want it to be. You know, they, you know, you, you might say that that's one of the characteristics of being human because most other creatures, they, they have very limited capacity to do that. They mostly just accommodate the world, you know, and, and they go on instincts and, and we're the tinkerers. We're like, well, I can make this better. I can build this or I can solve this problem and make the world a better place. So again, it's like a double-edged sword. I mean, that works to a degree. We've transformed the world. We've, in many ways, we've made life better for ourselves, even though we've created a whole host of other problems. Um, but at the same time, 
that is basically us not liking the way things are or the way people are. And so we're like, I'm, you know, I don't like the way this is and I'm going to change it. When you're somebody who's working with people with addiction, you know, that that's the natural human instinct. You know, this, the way this person is, is not okay. They're hurting themselves. They're hurting their family. They're hurting society. So I want them to get better. <laughs> I don't want them to be suffering. I don't want them to be doing all these terrible things. And so, you know, again, it's like the double edged, it's the balance, right? You know, I mean, you, you want them to get better. And then a lot of times they don't, or they have enormous setbacks and the path is very tortuous and you get frustrated naturally because you're like, why can't this person just get better? <laughs> <laughs> and be different, like I want them to be. Right. right. I think there's no, you know, permanent solution to that. You just got to be mindful and understand when you're, you're letting your desire for how you want things to be, you know, run amok and just getting back to, well, you know, yes, I do want things to be different. And this is how things are now. And it's, that's just the truth. <laughs> okay. Uh, difficult thing to do, isn't it? Yes. Life's an art, not a science. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not easy. <laughs> so we and it's should not know easy. That. Yeah. Yeah. It's not um, easy. Do you think that addicts are not afraid to die? Or why do you think they are not afraid to die? Well, I think a lot, a lot of addicts are afraid to die. You know, I think, I think it's, and no, no one addict feels the same way all the time. Some, some, some days they're just like, I just want, I want all this pain to end. And they, I mean, and they do take their own lives routinely, unfortunately. And then other days they're like, I just, I just want to get better. You know, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to keep getting these terrible skin infections from the injection sites. I just, I don't want everything to be, di I just want to be better. You know, and I think I think people oscillate between that, between, you know, just wanting it all to end by dying and just wanting it all to end by figuring out how to get better. And I think they all struggle with that, you know, from from moment to moment, day to day, month to month. You know, it's it's you know it changed a lot, right? Do you think that those who are addicted to drugs, they believe to be having a spiritual experience with the high? Most of the time, people who have long standing substance abuse problems, they do not get high anymore. And what happens is, is, is they're just obsessed with using and they also don't like the withdrawals. So a lot of people with substance abuse problems saying I, I keep using just to feel normal. So they're and they don't want to use they don't like it anymore. They don't get you know, they don't get high anymore because their brain chemistry has changed. They're just trying to, you know, using actually makes them feel normal because their brains are so used to the substance that as soon as it starts to get out of their system, they go through withdrawal and um, and you know, their emotions get all screwed up and it's it's a nightmare for them. So they're just trying to get back to feeling normal. They're not worried about spiritual experiences or highs anymore, you know, unfortunately. And that's part of the tragedy of it is they just can't stop. Wow. So my last questions to you, mm -hmm. what is your definition of well-being? I think well-being, um, another term I like to use is thriving. So in other words, you're not just surviving and getting by, but I think you feel relatively whole in mind and body. And it doesn't mean you don't have problems or health problems or anything else, but I think it, it, there's just this sense of being comfortable in your own skin and feeling like um, your life is meaningful and that you know, you know what's really important to you and you're doing something about that. Whether you're confined to a wheelchair, have to inject insulin or take an antidepressant, um, so again, I'm not saying, you know, I would not say well-being necessarily means the absence of mental or physical challenges. It's more like underneath the, all of that is this foundation of meaning, efficacy, and comfort with life as it is. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between awareness and knowledge? For me, awareness, awareness has more to do with sort of a clarity of seeing clarity of seeing what's in front of you, what's going on moment to moment in life. Knowledge is, is more like facts. You know, you, you know certain things about the world which appear to be true. 
And you can be very knowledgeable and can be completely unaware of life. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's right. Awareness. Yeah. Awareness is something that it's connected to spirituality a lot. You see, we say that a lot in Buddhism. Yes. What are three things about life you know for sure? Number one, uh, there's much more I will never know about life than I will ever know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> That, um, I'll, I'll accept that one as one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number two, you know, I know that life is very short and very precious. It's fleeting and ephemeral, and it's a profound mystery and a gift. Number three, as far as anybody knows, we only get one shot at it, so we should make the most of it. Where can we find more information about you, your work, products, services, your future projects? Probably, I don't have a huge online presence, but my LinkedIn profile, I know, says a lot about what my background is and what I'm doing and what I'm interested in. Um, I do have a blog on Medium um, where I post various musings about uh, life, the universe, and everything. And uh, yeah, those probably be the two main things. Great. Thank you so much for this conversation. It has been thought provoking and meaningful to me. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad it was helpful. I really enjoyed it. Yes. Thank you, Josh. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Okay. Bye for now. Bye for now. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Josh Sendeman, please visit his LinkedIn page. LinkedIn.com slash IN slash Joshua dash Sandeman. To learn more about future conversations, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. With gratitude and appreciation, I thank the Patreon members who support this podcast. Lawrence McGrath and Mark Basden. Thank you for listening. And bye for now.